everybody, my name is Amanda Pauly and I am Deputy Editor at Professional Beauty and today we're going to have a practical skills session as part of our PB Upskills lineup which is all about top tanning tricks for spray tanners. So today I'm joined by the amazing James Harknett, he's a celebrity tanner, uh, usually based at the W Hotel in London and he's going to reveal everything you need to know about how to make it in the industry as a successful spray tanner, revealing his top tips for achieving a flawless glow on every client, covering the common mistakes tanners make and how to avoid them, as well as sharing the keys to his success. Um, so James, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm, I'm very well, thank you. I'm very lucky to say I'm very well. Um, I'm missing my industry uh, tremendously. I uh, can't wait to get my hands on a spray gun, but that's why it's so lovely to talk to you today, Amanda, because I think this is great. And if anything I can do to help with anyone's tanning will be a pleasure today. Yeah, no, thank you so much for joining us. And um, just before we kind of get stuck into the subject matter, I just want to let everybody know who's watching that if you do have any questions for James, pop them in the comment box and we will make sure to um, get them answered for you. But I guess just before we kind of get stuck into the subject matter in greater detail, it'd be great if you could tell us, James, a bit about yourself and how you came to be one of the biggest spray tanners in the industry. I know that's with you just saying that that's going it's amazing feeling, you know, for you to say that, you know, it means a lot to me because I'm so passionate about this industry and this particular part of it, tanning. You know, um, no one wants to get me on their team at um, a Trivial Pursuit at Christmas because all I know is about tanning uh, <laughs> on Donna. Um, because it's, you know, it's in my blood, it's what I adore to do. Um, I've been doing it for 21 years. I started off in the year 2000 where I was working for Selfridges customer service and I wanted a change from it because it was quite a negative sort of industry to, to be with complaints and um, I went and sold fragrance on the shop floor, cut a long story short, and someone offered me a Saint-Tropez tan and I had that tan and it completely changed my life because I looked like a different person. It gave me confidence. It made me look like a, a new version of me where I'd never tanned in the past because my skin, as you can see, I've got a sort of very pink undertone. So I used to burn all the time, never had sort of hot holidays where I was sunbathing. Then all of a sudden I was golden, I was brown. Mm. So it made a huge difference to, to me at that point of my life in my 20s. And um, I embraced it. And then within about six weeks of that first treatment, I was selling bottles of saint Pay in Harvey Nichols um, in Knightsbridge, London. And that's how I started, as simple as that. And then I was there for two or three years and it was my idea to bring compressors, which was the first form of spray tan equipment to the shop floors, because there was something at that time around 2002, 2003, that were being used in salons and they were kind of like exploding. It was being huge business for people to have a spray tan. And I brought that onto the shop floor and then saint Pay sort of noticed something in me and made me a promotions manager. So I would go around the whole country, salons and shops, promoting their product, but by doing it with spray tan technology, because I just had such a passion and a flair for tanning. Um, mm -hmm. with my spray gun. I just loved it. I think because I had a dancing background, I sort of knew how to move around people's body with ease. And it's the simple skill, which a lot of tanners will agree with me, it's knowing how much product should be dispersed onto someone's skin tone, at a particular speed, for how long, and knowing which product to put on their skin, because every skin tone is different and unique and not every single product will suit it. So it's having that knowledge of knowing what will lay on the skin. And that part, early part of my career, I started being exposed to other tans through professional beauty. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember going to the beauty shows in around 2003, and I met like the owner of Fake Bake. And I saw all their different solutions, and I was kind of like, okay, I'm interested in this. And was like, sneakily getting a <laughs> Fake Bake one as well. Um, so it started from there, um, something that I was just very interested in myself. And then just having, you know, just the ability and having the passion to want to do it, because mm -hmm. it's a, a very social job. It's about meeting people, making them feel good. Um, having confidence with them so they feel confident and making them just feel a bit brighter and holiday ready and giving them conjuring up that holiday feeling on their skin and it's a real positive job it, it, it fills people myself and the person with a lot of with, with happiness it's great 
definitely I think definitely a tan has such a feel good effect on people um and I think people are really missing that at the moment yes but absolutely you said this kind of leads on to my next question you said obviously having a passion for the job is like a really important thing um yes. but what kind of other skills and experience do you need to sort of make it as a really successful spray tanner that's such a good question is because anyone really could become a spray tanner you know there's there's fantastic training out there from the company that i work with uh, fate bay to um a very good couple of good friends of mine who are spray tanners um eloise the tan expert and sophie take who um are trainers and they can give people their experts uh, expertise like i can um but you've got you've got to want to do it and you've got to want to embrace it. Now, a lot of people who I've spoken to who work in maybe a salon environment, and they do nails, they do massage, they do lashes, they do hair. Sometimes tanning is not their favorite thing. So I think you've got to really decide whether it's something that you like. And if you like doing it and you, and you embrace it and you like meeting people, going to their homes or being one-on-one -on -one with someone in a salon environment, then it's the job for you. You've got to like it. If it's something that's just an add-on in the salon, you kind of think, mm, I've got to do it, but no, then it's not for you. Then I'd say concentrate on the thing that you love. Um, but that's a very important factor is to enjoy it uh, because the person you're with can feel very vulnerable. They are getting naked with you. And if that, especially if you're a stranger to them, you know, I take my hat off to a lot of men and women that meet me for the first time and they're taking all their clothes off and they're kind of bare in front of me. But I think once they meet me, they can tell that I am not phased by nudity, that I all I wanna do is make them look and feel good. And they, they feel that energy for me and that puts them at ease. And then they jo enjoy the experience. That's my kind of my, one of my single pieces of advice for any spray tanner or anyone starting in the industry is create an experience for your client. You're not just dousing them down, they're not a car. <laughs> You're not gonna, um, and that's something we're going to in, in a moment with the way that you do spray someone and the skill set of that. It's like I look at someone as a blank canvas or I look at it like I'm a makeup artist and I want someone to be ready for that photo shoot or ready for their wedding day. I want them to look amazing immediately. And when they look back in the mirror after they've had that treatment from me, they look in there and they go, oh, I didn't know it was going to look that good straight away. And then bang, you've got them. And they're hooked and they'll be your customer then for a very long time yeah definitely and i guess as well for a lot of people landing celebrity clients and work on tv is like a real goal um is there like a key way to do this to elevate someone's profile in the tanning world and land this kind of work like is it who you know or like it who you know it can be luck it could be your brother-in-law's best friend's sister works as a, a runner at this TV company and they're gonna put a word in. Because for me, I was in the right place at the right time, but the reason that I succeeded is because I wasn't pushy, but I always made myself available. And mm. I've always kind of been there and never said no. And if you just have that kind of like, that, that fire in your stomach to wanna to do something, and at that particular point in my life, it was around 2008, I was still working for Saint Tropez and during one of my spray tan evenings, I went to an evening event for Terence Higgins Trust. Thought, well, that'd be good. And I went with my friend Sophie and we tanned people. And I met uh, a guy called Brian Friedman, who at the time was a choreographer for Britney Spears. Mm -hmm. And he was doing the X Factor. Now we hit it off and I tanned his face on the shop floor. He was like, wow, this is great. Have you got a card? Mm -hmm. And that's how my TV journey started organically like that. I was in the right place at the right time, but I gave him an experience and I gave him a great tan. <laughs> I'm on a good, because it's all about not overdoing it, giving someone the glow. You don't want to douse them down in product. I wanted to make him, he had a champagne glass in his hand and then he could go around shopping and having a sort of social evening with the tan on without being self-conscious that he was fake tanned. He looked airbrushed to perfection. And that's what got me in the door of X Factor a year or so later, which then led to other things. It's kind of a snowballing effect. But I think to my advice to everyone who's all around the country and they might not be near a television station or think that's ever going to happen to them, think, I hate the saying, think outside the box. I hate all those sayings that got on my nerves. But just think, 
well, press-wise, have we got a, a local gazette? Have we got a, a local newspaper? Have we got a local magazine? Mm. Everyone has. Everyone has. Then maybe contact them and offer a free treatment. I have done more free treatments in the last 21 years than anyone because <laughs> I don't look at it as a free, but I look at it as I'm, I'm selling myself. I'm selling my skill set. I'm selling this experience to people. And all it can take is one line of someone saying, had a spray tan from this guy, uh, James. Uh, here's his phone number, give him a call. That could be in a, in a magazine. You could get 10, 15, 20 calls from that. That could be loyal clients for many years to come. So it's about thinking who you can reach out to, whether it's the local gym, whether it's someone who does Pilates, you know, it's, and it's asking, you know, I wasn't very kind of good with social media when it first kind of came around with Facebook and Twitter, you know, 10, 12, 15 years ago, I was kind of like, oh, I think I've missed the boat on that. I'm not very tech. I'm a tanner, not a techno. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so but there's, I've, I've done um, masterclasses for Fake Bake and my previous brand that I, I was with called Sienna. And I created a masterclass. And that masterclass wasn't just how, how much solution you put in your spray gun and the technique of how you spray. It was all the marketing that went with it. And I would tell people like my, my journey and what I've done. And that gave people kind of just clues of what to do themselves. Like, okay, I will get into contact with the, with the local spa or the, because I'm a mobile therapist, doesn't mean that I can't go and do a day a week in the salon down the road. It's all kind of like, it's all like that. It's kind of thinking, how can I reach out? Um, and with social now, you can, you know, with groups and getting the word out there and mums in the school, on the school run, all that sort of thing. Yeah. It's, it's much easier. Mm. Yeah, people are loving this advice. They're saying your masterclasses have been fab. And also people are loving the story as well of just how you came to get this kind of stuff. Because I think as well, technology is such a big part of our lives now. But obviously when you first started out, Instagram and things like that aren't as big as they are now. Well, so black white TV sets when I started. <laughs> no, but you know, I feel like Instagram, like the last five years, it's just completely blown up, hasn't it? So I guess- It has. And I think my advice for anyone using Instagram who want to get clients, it's quite difficult because it's like, if you want to if say yourself or me wanted to find the best tanner, the best hairdresser, the best nail technician, the best mm -hmm. this, that and the other, I don't think we're going to kind of go onto Instagram and put in hashtag best mm. to find what comes up. But what you can use your Instagram for is kind of your portfolio, your shop window your body of work. So what I do with my Instagram, James Harkley underscore Tan, if you're out there, you know, follow me. Um, <laughs> quite dull, it's all about tell, about me and Tans. Um, however, it's, um, it's there for me to show what I do. So I ask a lot of my clients or I wait for them to send me a picture, especially if it's a bride. Um, I love them to say, oh, James, do you want a picture? Um, or they tag me. I never, something I've done, with famous people or people who are in the public eye, I've never asked them to, can you give me a shout out? You know, mm -hmm. because, you know, for some people, their tanning experience, they want it to be discreet or they might not want people to know they've had a spray tan or you know, for whatever reason. So it's nice when people offer, or when, once you get a rapport with people, once you get a relationship with them, you can mm -hmm. then say, oh, could you send me one of those pics of you because you look so lovely in my tan? Do you mm. mind if you tag me and say you've had a glow by me or, you know, you've had a professional finish by me? But however you word it, it's, it's lovely. And then that can kind of, you can put that on your social, on your yeah. Facebook and on your Instagram. And yeah. um, people can see what you do. Yeah, no, that's great advice. And I guess now's the perfect time to kind of really work on that kind of portfolio on your Instagram at the moment, why people are closed and kind of get that body of work that you want on there to kind of showcase. Yeah, yeah I, I was lucky because before we went into tier four in London, which was, I think, it was the day I started doing Dancing on Ice. So Fake Bake um, have um, get, I've got the, the deal for Dancing on Ice and I've done it for them for years. I love it. And um, we went to go and do the pre-records. It was around the 16th of December, I think, or maybe, maybe afterwards, I can't remember. However, that was when we went into tier four. So we got the pre-records done. And then I thought to myself, oh, do you know, I'm not gonna be able to do this, um, probably going into the new year, things go, 
could get like this. So just before that time, I managed to get a couple of photo shoots in, two or three. I think I did them all in a week, loads of photo shoots. So I've now had those photos come in, so I can now kind of like say, oh, this is what I've done. And this is kind of my new kind of spring, summer portfolio. Mm. So I was lucky that I got a bit of work in in November. Because like yeah. everybody now, I'm sort of chomping at the bit to get the tan out. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone is, aren't they, in the industry? Yeah. Um, and I guess as well, something that would be good to ask you is just, you know, when it comes to achieving a flawless glow on clients every time, exactly. what are the key things that tanners need to consider and how important is the consultation? Consultation is so important, but even before the consultation, it's having that client, especially if they're new, new to, new to you and new to tanning, is their preparation, the preparation process for them at home. Now everyone says, oh, their prep got to exfoliate. Now exfoliating is great, especially if you're particularly dry, if your skin's a bit tall in the winter, if you have particular dryness in the areas which don't produce sort of natural moisture, like your elbows, for instance. That's mm. why people say to me, oh, my elbows are always quite scaly, they're quite red, they're quite pink. The tan picks up because there's no natural moisture there. So mm. the DHA and the product, it really sort of seeps into these areas like there on the hands, Mm. on the knees, on the, on the back of the heel and on the feet, kind of think of the areas which are less fleshy, which mm. are more dry. And that is the areas where tan tends to stick. So what you want to tell your clients to do is their hair removal a good day or so before. If they're a waxer, at least two days, maybe three. Because what waxing does, as well as removing the hair particle, is strips the skin. Mm. Fake tan, the ingredient, our self-tan sprays, mousses, lotions, gels, need skin cells, dead skin cells, to bind with. They bind with and turn them brown. So if you've just stripped all the skin off your leg or you've exfoliated within an inch of your life or you've just shaved, mm. your tan has got less proteins, dead skin to you and I, <laughs> on the body for it to cling to. I've got one lady, she says, I now exfoliate the morning of my tan when you come in the evening rather than just before. And I find it goes a little darker now. It clings a bit darker. And because I, I tan around normally when life was normal before all this uncertainty and madness, I used to tan about 50, 60, 70 people a week. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing that for like 13, 14 years since I launched my service. So you get feedback of all these thousands of skin tones, these people telling you how it how it affects them because everyone's different but that's how i've come up with a different kind of set of preparation tips um where every magazine or back of a product says exfoliate moisturize do not moisturize before a tan you it's like mixing paint with water moisturize <laughs> sparingly on the areas where you think where you know it could cling mm. if you don't want your product too dark on the face then moisturize and that's where tanning water and drops have come in, into play over the recent years because you can, you can sort of be very sort of prescriptive with it and mix the drops with your skincare, with your day cream, with your night cream, with your daily moisturizer and be very bespoke with it. So I see why there's a huge market for them, especially for the face. But prep is everything. And um, it can be prepping the feet as well, you know, making sure that they're, they're not too buff, not too dry. And all these things that come, in, come into play really affect the flawless tan. Because if, I suppose someone comes to see me in my salon, or I go to their home and they've, say it's been a warm day and they've perspired, or they've used a product which is a little bit oily and the remnants of that oil is on their skin. I may spray them beautifully and I see the product go on lovely. They wash it off in eight hours on the next morning and they've got big marks. Mm. And that's not because I did a bad job. It's because they had something on their skin blocking the tan from working. Fake tan, self-tan is not makeup. It's something that works naturally with the skin. So we have to make sure everything, like a clear canvas and everything is all ready and you've got nothing on the skin apart from that moisture where you need it. And then you'll have a flawless color. I had a bride a couple of years ago, and she said, she rang me the next day, and she said, James, great color, I love the color, I want it for my wedding. However, you made my strap lines darker. Now that's a new one. That's not something that gets talked about. And you made my strap lines darker. Now the reason was, 
she was wearing, she was, she um, had quite a large breast and so she was wearing quite a tight bra. So mm-hmm. you're thinking wearing a bra every day, which is quite tight on the back. Mm-hmm. So basically the bra straps were compacting the skin cells. Oh gosh, yeah. So there was a buildup on the lines of skin. So when the tan went on, it clung darker to those lines. I didn't kind of strategically get my gun and go, I must fill in her lines. You know, it was just something that happened very naturally. So I said, right, leading up to the wedding, the next tan, I want you every day to gently take a bit more time to exfoliate those strap lines a bit more, use a bit, maybe something a bit more gritty than normal, because I don't like people over exfoliating with something too strong and harsh. And she did that, mission accomplished. And also it can happen around here. For me, I get it around my tummy where sometimes my skinny jeans are a bit tight on my tummy, <laughs> too many Starbucks cream horns. Um, and I get like um, a, a dark line around my tummy because the, the, the tan clings darker there. So there's lots of things that can, you can kind of um, achieve just by trial and error. Yeah. So I've, come up, I've come up against everything. That's why I say to people, ask me anything. I've probably, it's probably happened to me and I'll know what the, the, the trick is to help you. Yeah, I guess as well, because especially if you're new to tanning, I guess things like this can make you feel a bit conscious about yourself and your work. But I guess it's just about knowing um, how to fix something and having the confidence to explain it to the client. Um, yeah. because sometimes they don't want to he- hear it because yeah. they, they don't want to think it's them. Like I had a lady for her wedding, she waxed her arms the day before she came to see me, fine. And so she had like, when the tan washed up, she had um, pale blocks on her arm mixed mm-hmm. in with the brown tan. So I said, right, that's going to be, I'm going to have to come on the day. And I actually airbrushed her with makeup, which was didn't transfer. Um, it, it luckily worked out. Mm. <laughs> and obviously, um, you mentioned about you know not paying attention to kind of like the elbows and the ankles and the particularly dry areas of the skin when tanning. But are there any kind of other common mistakes that tanners can make when they're doing a treatment that they should be aware of so that they can avoid these kind of situations arising? Over spraying, over tanning putting too much product on and I've seen it a lot I've you know I've worked in all sorts of amazing places with team things as well I remember back in in the early no it was in late zeros early millennium I did a take that tour yeah amazing <laughs> um and I worked with some lovely people on it but there was one town I was working with and she was like, <laughs> <I> was like <laughs> she was doing it really quick and it was great but it was dripping off some of the dancers' legs because mm. there was too much product. Um, mm. When I've done all my master classes over the years, which I've written and um, kind of given out to many salons and individuals, mobile therapists, all tanners, all over the country, which I love doing. And it's one thing, once we get into the practical and I want to see everyone spray, it's the simple thing of like, I say, can I just turn your gun pressure down? So like on my machine here, which is my favorite machine by a brand called Aura. I love this machine. I've used it for five years. Fake Bake introduced me to it. And it's incredible. Now what I've got here is a dial there. And if I turn it clockwise, that can just, it's in charge of how much comes out of my gun here. So when I press that, it's going to decide how much is dispersed. So it can be a very light mist. It could be something a bit more ferocious, which is which you don't want. I'd, my advice to everyone is work in finer layers rather than one thick, heavy spray tan. Now, mm-hmm. the only product which you can sort of, you can get away with doing just one coat and you can be really assured that that's all you need um, is like a express tan. Something that I've been using a lot and something I would give advice for people to use or try, especially this year with everyone wanting to be so clean is an express formula that you can wash off in around an hour. Mm. They're great. They're all, of, all the ones on the market are a little bit different. I've sort of helped Fake Bake tweak theirs and it's called 60 Minutes. And it's one of the best hands I, I, I could ever used in 21 years now. I have probably about 20, 30 people addicted to it. Not only does it last on the skin around 10 days or two weeks, it just, it, one coat is all you need, 
a beautiful mm -hmm. guide color. And then you can wash it off in either an hour, 19 minutes, two hours, depending on the depth of color you want. So that's a really good product to try, like an express formula. But getting back to your question, just kind of be confident with, with what's going on to your client. Mm -hmm. So what I do before I start the tanning process with the client, I always test it on my arm because I want to know how it feels. I want to know what that what the product feels like the pressure feels mm -hmm. like because you, you no one wants to sort of be sort of blasted in tan so one nice gentle coat and then you can go back to areas that you maybe want to build up like for a lot of my clients it's like oh can you give me a six pack can you contour me it's still <laughs> a word that's thrown around a lot because it, people immediately think they're going to look a bit fitter bit more athletic um, and it's that whole process is something that I teach in my master classes is when you're bringing the, the gun this way because we're all taught to spray this way and that's great but when you bring it this way you're almost kind of sucking in you're making the client feel as the gun comes in here under the tongue under the boobs or for guys on the top of the bicep and under here when you're layering up with the product it immediately makes you feel like you've been um contoured like you're being um sprayed thinner like you're a sculpture it isn't a, it's a and it looks good because those areas then start to be more shaded so i do kind of look at it more like makeup artistry in that way yes at the end of the day your skin will absorb the amount of dha it needs but that's why i kind of swear by products which have a guide color in guide color now in most hands looks so authentic, it looks like the tan, it mimics the tan. And it's mm -hmm. kind of semi-staining as well. So that's why you can use it quite cosmetically to shade. And I do that on a lot of my photo shoots that I do. Mm. Um, James, so many people want to know what the name of that machine is. <laughs> <Do they? laughs> yeah. so um, a lot of the brands um, have got connections with this and they sell it. And it's the Aura. And it's very retro looking but the reason i love it not is it sprays so well plugged in there you go so it's gold and black uh, long hose on it and it kind of like looks like a really cool 60 1960s hoover <laughs> it's quiet compared to most sort of air compressors and tanning booths mm. almost like a hair dryer so <laughs> when you're having that one-on-one -on -one experience and you're spraying someone you can hear yourself think and you can hear them even mm. with your mask on because mm. that's very important to communicate with your client rather than just saying turn around this one you know it's nice to kind of have a band to have conversation and then they forget they're naked as well and they feel so relaxed it's all mm. about making that person feel relaxed and if you yeah. can, if you can hear yourself through the through the tanning it's great and with this like i said before you're in control of it you turn it up you turn it down test it on yourself it's lightweight it's so light. It's one of the lightest spray guns I've ever used. And this is fantastic. You can clean it very easily. And you can really sort of build up the product on people's skin with it. You can, you can be like a makeup artist with their brush. Mm. So I've been using this for five years and have a look at my Instagram to look at some of the tans that I've achieved by using this. Mm. And, it's, and it's by a company called Aura, A-U-R-A. -A. They're on Instagram as well. Um, very good technology. Yeah. And we've had a couple of questions come in just about techniques. So I just thought I'd run them by you before we kind of move on. Um, but we had a question about any tips on tanning runners who have natural tan lines. Interesting question. That is really good because, I, of course, I come up with that a lot in the summer months or all year round mm -hmm. when people that work out. A lot, of, a lot of brides come to me with the same thing and they're like, on a holiday, I've got tan lines. Can you mm -hmm. fill it in? Now remember, DHA tanning sprays are not makeup. They're not gonna just perfect everything. But what they're gonna do is they're gonna help even out. Because if you tan someone and this part of their skin up here is lighter, when you tan evenly on the body and they wash it off, it's not all gonna be one strength because if you went in the sun, it wouldn't do that. If you went and had got your tan lines out to, to, to tan them naturally, they're not gonna just even out all of a sudden because they've been exposed to some sun. So it's the same with the spray tan. So what I say to people is it was gonna help do, it's gonna help even out and camouflage a little bit. But what you can do 
is maybe do like a second treatment the next day, especially if you could give someone a good self tan recommendation, like mm. they just get their mitt with maybe their, their mousse and they could fill in that area a second day just to mm. make it a little bit darker. But you're never gonna get away from that completely because it's not a makeup. It's something that's working with the skin. It's, mm. not, a, it's not a paint or a body dye. So you're, you're working with the natural skin here. But good question. Um, yeah, just to tell the client that what you're gonna do is you're gonna help even out. Yeah. And um, we had a question from Kaz as well, who asked if people want to be darker, do you just need to do more layers or should you use a darker percentage? Use a, use a darker tan um definitely and then maybe layer that up a bit especially on the legs for instance um a lot of the brands that are out there the professional brands they all have more than one tan now they have maybe a light a medium and a dark um mm. like fake bake i work with we have original which has been around for about 15 20 years and then we have one that's called darker and that's a love that's a lovely product and um i just use that one coat of that on so many people and it adapts to their skin tone but I would say use, yeah, use a darker strength, something that's got a higher percentage of DHA in it. But then two coats of, say you've got a medium color that's classed as a medium tan. Hmm. Just kind of be a bit bespoke with it yourself and think, right, where's gonna benefit that client if I put like an extra coat on them, if I layer up? maybe because a lot of brides say to me my back's going to be out in my dress my arms are out I'm a little self-conscious of my arms so mm. what I do they stand out there and I say right we're going to spritz over we're going to do an extra dusting over the shoulders around the collarbone and chest and back and it just pushes the product into the skin that little bit deeper for maximum effect and like I said before the guide color in them products like I said I find it semi-staining a little bit and that will just give it a bit more strength in the colour. Mm. Hope that helps. Yeah, definitely. Um, and we had another comment, um, and this one says, one day I had a bit of a heavier client whose skin had a lot of creases. Tan wasn't even in the creases. She wasn't happy with that. I knew it was because of the creases, yet I didn't know what to say to not offend her. It's really hard. Difficult, um, isn't it? I, I can't with that many times. And uh, you then get into the territory of, I don't want to say, I don't want to make an issue out of this. However, I want their tan to be spot on. And mm -hmm. like, I have like a big mirror of when people come out of my, the booth. So sometimes they will go like that and they're stretched the skin and they go, oh, you've missed that bit here. It's just like there. Mm -hmm. But sometimes people have like, um, you know, their skin can fold, their skin can mm -hmm. have lines. We're not perfect. And the thing is, that comes down to your movement. That's something that I teach in classes as well. And it's like when someone, say, turns round, and it's kind of, if they're, if they're kind of, their, their skin is overlapping here, stretch and forward so that the back opens. And then it's mm -hmm. kind of like, like here as well. So this all opens and then kind of get into those areas. And if you're a bit kind of self-conscious about it, that it's getting a bit wet there from the tan, dry it. But I use, I have um, the W, I just have like my hair dryer. I have a Dyson, I go and blast that on people. For the larger bus, for, for larger ladies, what I ask them to do before we've tanned the chest, I ask them to lift the boobs. And so I spray gently underneath, mm. then I dry, then they relax, and then I can carry on with the rest of the body. And in that way, they're not going to have white marks underneath the boobs. So yeah. if you think it out, think of where you're going, look at the body in front of you and the person, and in seconds, you should be able to think, right, they're a little bit bigger there, so I'm going to just take that into account, and I'm going to get them to do this. Or it's like mm -hmm. all the kind of folds at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Always make sure that the, the client stands forward. So the natural folds around the bottom, towards the, from the leg down, they open up, get it sprayed, bit of air if it feels a little bit damp for them you think good all good to go mm, no that's great advice i mean in your opinion what would you say is the most challenging part of the body to spray tan that's an interesting question um feet and hands is where i think most people struggle and because like i said before like the hands they're less fleshy they're drier 
these areas here where the knuckles are. Mm. These are probably the, the hardest place to get right. So my advice is minimal moisture first across the hands into the cuticle and then take that moisture around the wrist as well. I'll explain why in a moment. So across the hand, around the wrist, so you, with your barrier cream, with your moisture, to just to have that sort of first layer sort of protected so it doesn't over absorb, okay? And then what I do is do the hands kind of nearly last. So they're out like that, and everyone's got their own technique of doing the hands, some circle round or do a crew. I kind of like, it's kind of like reducting over them very gently and it's a very gentle mist. Then it's kind of like that, and then it's like that. And then I open the knuckles, the claw, and people say, oh, Thriller, Lady Gaga. And <laughs> opening those, those gentle sort of little cracks there inside the, the, the fingers, so that when they gently close, they do have a little bit of color in them. So that when they're a bit like the knees, when they're kind of open and exposed like that, you don't see white bits. Oh. But the trick is not to over tan them. So it's a gentle mist rather than a thick old mist. You can always go back, but you can't take off. Mm. So they're probably the most challenging. And also, like I see it a lot and I hate looking at someone's tan and it kind of cuts off like a brown jumper, like a <laughs> Or it sort of just smudges onto the, the hand there. I was looking at some tans just before Christmas on television. I'm not going to say what one. <laughs> and it was right there. I'm like, why is that on there? Why mm. the tanner spray onto there? Now, it could be a number of reasons. Maybe the person like kind of slept with it and it's smudged. They have their arm between their leg, that sort of thing. Um, but that's why I moisturize here. And I mm. take my gun, almost feathering it, and it was something that was written about me, which I really kind of loved. And it was a guy called Jim Chapman. He writes for GQ, huge follower. He's, a, he's lovely. Um, and he had an experience with me. And he said, I like the way that he textured and graduated it towards these parts of my body. So it did mimic a real tan I've had on holiday. I didn't look like I had a spray tan. So mm. my advice to everyone is, do it more gently as you're coming in towards the hands. Less product towards here, because look, my inner arms are lighter than the tops of my arms. Yeah. You don't stand in the sun going. <laughs> and our bodies are naturally exposed to mm. color from the sun's natural sunshine. So they're more conditioned for tanning. So mm. these parts, lighter, and then graduated towards there, and it'll look perfect. <laughs> James, we've had loads of questions come through, so I'm going to try. I'll be, I'll be quicker, sorry. No, no, no. I'm going to try and get as many of these through as we can before, because um, it's all around kind of stuff that you're saying. And one person's asked, "How do you get around a sweaty client, especially if they have sweaty underarms?" Um, right, you've got to get. I always have in my salon. I have in my studio a pile of flat face cloths, which mm. I say right. I can tell if they're a bit hot. Most people in London, they come to see me, even in the winter, are hot. The tubes are boiling, we're rushing around. Mm. So take a warm flannel, wipe away the perspiration. If you can, and if you've got in your salon, if you've got a shower, ask people to take a quick, cool rinse before the tan. Don't have to lather up, get wet, get fresh, get out, back in a row with your paper knickers on or what have you. If you go into their home, but like maybe 20 minutes before you arrive you, you, or you're on your journey, you stop and you text them and say, right, I'll be at this time, estimated time, pop in the shower, have a quick rinse. Mm. So you're washing off the perspiration because perspiration will barrier. And also you see tan go on to sweaty skin and it goes green. And it's yeah. and it kind of like, when this is where I struggle with the skaters on Dancing on Ice, bless them. They come off the ice, they've been working all day and then we spray them and sometimes they've got sweat on them. So we were having to give them warm towels to get it off. Otherwise that really gets in the way. So quick rinse or flannels to take it all away. Yeah. Um, we had another question as well saying, I'm hearing a lot of mixed messages regarding skin tones and spray tan base colors. Is that merely a marketing trick as the different colors are only in the bronzers which you can wash off and DHA is colorless? That's, do you know what is absolutely correct? It's just said that. You know, do you, that the reason there's a lot of clear sprays and tanning waters um, on the market now, which they kind of were 60 years ago. When self-tan hit the market, it was kind of clear creams, white creams. I remember in the 80s, I used to use my sister's Clinique, rub it in Ryan like that, and I used to have these orange, orangey 
kind of finger mark tan all around here where I hadn't put it on right. Mm. So it was Fate Bake and Saint Chapay that kind of broke the mold of that in, in the mid to late nineties by putting in a guy color so people could then see where they were going. Mm. So yes, DHA is clear. So the different bronzers in the ingredients can help, in my opinion, and like I said, I've been spraying people, I've been spraying since 2002, telling for 21 years, I put my hand on my heart and I say, the different bronzers in the DHA-based products make a difference. They can knock out different tones. Like mm -hmm. if you put something which has got more of a ready base on a yellow undertone, say I was a bit yellowy, and I put something ready, what does red and yellow make? Orange. So that's why sometimes you can see people, they've had a flawless product put on, they've, they've put something, they've had it done maybe in a salon, maybe done it themselves flawlessly, and it can look a bit orangey. There's a mm -hmm. fine line with tan. So my advice is shop about, use, go on forums, on beauty sites. So I've got this skin type and this product agrees with me. Get that sort of advice. But I've always used lots of different tans throughout the years. I've, I've, I've worked with them all and I've, I've used them and I buy them. So I can test them on myself, on my partner, because my partner, he's very olive and I'm very pinky pale. So we've got the, the different skin tones. So I can test all different products. I think the different bronzers and all the different brands on the market work particularly well with different skin tones. I mm. really do. Yeah, no, that was a great question. Um, we had another one who said, I had a client whose legs never saw the sun, but her feet did. Her legs didn't take the tan, but her feet did. I was horrified. I've never been taught this in training. What should you do when this happens? That has come up a lot of times with me that people have said, you've missed. Why didn't it take on me? I think most people have an area of skin on their body that doesn't tan very well with self tan, with spray tans, with fake tan, and possibly from the sun as well. Uh, like my partner, he doesn't, when I tan him here, it won't seem to take. He, when you, he used to say, you've missed me there. And he used to fill it in with a bit of bronzer. Um, and a lot of people have areas of their body where it just won't take. However, legs are the hardest place for women to tan. And they all say it to me, my face tans, my chest, my arms, the beautiful colour and my legs. Now, because most of our climate here in this country and most women's legs are encased either in trousers and tights and socks, and yeah. they don't see a lot of sun actually. Mm. So kind of their legs are looking a lot paler. So what I advise them to do is gentle exfoliation, good two or three days before, and then try a couple of coats and then maybe try it again the next day. Now it can be that some people, they just, it doesn't, DHA just doesn't work on them or they're allergic to it. That's very few and far between. Mm. But you've got to think of those areas of skin which are not sort of conditioned to tanning naturally. And that can sometimes be the problem. So mm. nice gentle um, exfoliation, waxing two days before at least, or not at all, but quick shave 24 hours before. And then maybe try a couple of layers or two days running. It may make a difference. Yeah, no, that's really great advice. Um, and we had another question as well about whether you could recommend a budget spray tan machine for students to purchase while they're practicing who can't afford to buy the bigger brands until they've kind of finished college and started working. Well, I know like Fake Bank do one. It's a, it's a small uh, little compressor with a really big gun actually, it's great. You can get loads of solution wow. in, like you get two or three bodies without having to fill it up again. And that's really affordable. And then of course, if you look on eBay right now, you could probably pick up a gun really cheap, especially mm -hmm. because a lot of people who've like gone into different professions and they used to do it on the side, oh, I've got my kit, I don't use it anymore. I'm gonna sell it. You can always sort of snag a bargain on the internet now. I've looked yeah. at doing it myself before. I like to have some backup guns and backup machines in my car and in my salon. And I thought, okay, if I can't afford, you know, cause a lot of them can be very expensive, but mm -hmm. the Aura one I think is like a real investment item. Um, and it's, I do a lot of tans in it and it all, the motor lasts quite a while for doing so many, but yeah, look at the cheaper options as well. But Fake Bake have a lot of, have a cheaper one that yeah. they do. 
And we probably have time to squeeze in one more question. Um, and we had a question from Donna who asked, what's the best way to tan someone with vitiligo? Oh God, that's a really good question as well. Now, I remember I had some clients coming in on the shop floor with me back in Harvey Nichols in the early 2000s. And I had one class, couple of customers that had vitiligo. And at the time, Sandra Pay, who I was selling, they'd just been, um, Oh, what's the word? I can't. I can't think of the word. Um, associated, recommended by the Vitiligo Association. Um, now, what it is, it was because the bronzer at the time in that Saint Tropez uh, lotion. It was. We didn't have mousse at the time. It was just lotion, and it was that one that everyone said, "Oh, it looked like mud." Mm. The bronzer in that was almost like makeup. So what you could do, you could blend, and you could build up on the area, especially areas on the neck. Mm. And hands where the skin you know loses pigmentation and it was quite it helped camouflage mm. it didn't disguise it it didn't go and i will say to anyone don't ever think that using fake tan is going to disguise with ligo i say try it mm. try it out but what i found in um in the last few years is that I rarely get people asking uh, for to have their vitiligo shaded in. I don't know. I think it's just a whole new awareness and a whole new sort of way people look at stuff in like vitiligo, for instance, like embrace it. You know, like yourself, you're a very fair skin, so am I. I can mm -hmm. embrace my fair skin now. Um, but then sometimes, most of the time, I like to be brown as well. Mm. So actually, I am tanned at the moment because you know I don't want to flush anything. But you can <laughs> see my natural colour. There's my natural colour. I hope that shows up. Yeah, no, you very, very. Look at me just <laughs> on the screen at this time of the day. I am very, very fair, but I just have like this is only a week old now, and I just like it in the winter. Twice a month, I have a tan that lasts me most of the month. No, it looks so natural. But James, that's all we have time for. We're going to have to get you back on again at some oh, point. I'd love to. I'd love to. I'd love so to. <laughs> um, for anybody who has watched and they've joined in after about 10 minutes, they've been asking if they can watch this back. As soon as we finish this live, um, this will be available on PB's Facebook indefinitely. It'll be going on our IGTV in about an hour or two and on our YouTube. So you can go back watch it from the start but james thank you so much we're definitely going to get you back um thank, thank you for everyone for watching and asking questions yeah no we've had loads of questions we'll have to have you back but thank you everybody for watching and i hope it's been really useful and we do actually have another upskill session in 12 minutes so <laughs> if you want to have more education um you can watch our md mark maloney interviewing louise from Seth skin spa um, talking about how to navigate the pandemic as a spa owner so um yeah definitely one to check out but thank you so much james thank you and so hopefully much. we'll get you back soon and, uh, and professional beauty pleasure yeah no thank you so much guys thank you everyone for watching see you later bye, bye.